The year was 1896. Swedish physicist turned chemist Svate Arrhenius wanted to explain ice ages. To do this, he calculated that concentrations of special gases in the atmosphere, called greenhouse gases, like water and carbon dioxide, which trap heat in the lower atmosphere, can change in concentration over time, creating geological periods of warmth and cold. This made him ask another question. Humans had been burning a lot of coal over the 19th century, jump-starting the Industrial Revolution, but as a byproduct released the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide. He calculated that this would be enough to warm Earth's climate and published a paper. But as a citizen of such a northern country in Europe, thinking about the devastation the cold brings to crops and societies in northern Europe, he thought this could be a good thing, making the colder parts of the world more productive for crops and habitable to man. And like that, nobody thought about the possible devastating consequences of a warming climate for the next half a century, or make any headway on mitigating it. So how do these greenhouse gases work? The sun gives off energy in the form of light, some of which passes through the atmosphere. Some is absorbed as heat, but much is reflected back into space. Greenhouse gases, though, reflect this energy back at Earth, giving it more of a chance of being absorbed, warming the lower atmosphere and ground. As Arrhenius and previous scientists had pointed out, these gases are essential for keeping Earth far warmer than the cold vacuum of space that surrounds it. When their concentrations fall, an ice age may occur. The most prevalent greenhouse gas is water vapor, and is most responsible for keeping Earth hospitable to life. Next most prevalent is carbon dioxide, followed at a distance by other gases like methane, ozone, nitrous oxide, and chlorofluorocarbons. The issue is today, as humans burn ancient carbon sources kept out of the atmosphere for millions of years, the concentration in the atmosphere of these gases has increased dramatically. With the increased concentration of these gases, more energy is absorbed in the lower atmosphere and the planet warms. As the planet warms, water vapor in the air can reach higher concentrations due to the clausius clapeyron relation, creating a positive feedback loop that amplifies the effect of the other greenhouse gases, causing further warming. With these simple rules and facts, you now know the basics of how human-caused climate change works. We now have a much broader understanding of climate than when Arrhenius first figured out humans could warm the planet by burning coal, and hopefully are also mostly beyond our cultural biases so we can see being able to farm on the tundra is not the only consequence of a warming planet. And most of those other consequences are bad. First comes the logical conclusion. If the planet is warmer, then all the ice will melt. This is disastrous for arctic species like polar bears which require a frozen ocean to feed themselves, but it also leads to global sea level rise. The sea ice over the Arctic Ocean where the polar bears live, though, is not the issue. Although its disappearance creates a feedback because ice reflects light and energy back into space, while open sea absorbs light increasing the effect of the warming. The issues are all the glaciers and ice sheets covering the island of Greenland and the continent of Antarctica, which are on solid land. So we'll add water into the world's ocean. This will likely result in a rise in sea level of a meter or two over the rest of the 21st century, displacing potentially hundreds of millions of people and leading to more common flooding events damaging more coastal communities, though these short-term estimates for sea level rise may be conservative. Ultimately, there is enough frozen water in Antarctica and Greenland to raise the global sea level well over 60 meters. Warmer temperatures melt snow in mountains earlier, causing forests to dry out in addition to a higher frequency of drought, leading to more intense fires, as seen in both the Amazon and Australia in 2019 and 2020, which releases more carbon into the atmosphere, exasperating the warming problem. The release of carbon dioxide also has another side effect beyond just being a greenhouse gas. When it becomes dissolved in water, it goes through a reaction creating carbonic acid, which lowers the pH of the ocean. Used to the slightly basic conditions of the ocean, many organisms build hard parts out of calcium carbonate, a material that easily dissolves outside of more basic environments, including snails and coral, ultimately killing the organism, which is bad because these organisms are important to the health of fish populations, leading to fishery collapses, and on coral reefs, famous for their biodiversity, a wave of declines and extinctions. Increasing temperatures will also devastate species on tropical mountains. Unlike species in temperate or even polar zones that have to be adapted to a fairly wide variety of temperatures, many tropical mountain species can only survive in a narrow band of temperature due to the lack of seasonality. These are the species most threatened by increasing temperatures. 
Sure, some can move upslope to escape temperatures too warm for them, but ultimately they will become trapped on the mountain peaks with nowhere to go and vanish from the world. Increasing temperatures can prove fatal to humans too. Temperatures in extremely humid conditions above 35 degrees Celsius can cause heat stroke as the human body cannot effectively thermoregulate in these conditions, leading to some parts of the tropics becoming increasingly inhospitable to human life. Climate change has an unequal effect on certain regions and on different socioeconomic levels, leading to increased violence and migration with increasing poverty and food and water resources becoming less dependable. There are even some statistics to suggest that higher temperatures are correlated with people being more violent. So how do we prevent a wave of climate-linked extinctions and chaos? The key is mitigating the effect of burning carbon from carboniferous lycopods and panthalassa phytoplankton. To stop the climate from warming, we need to get our carbon emissions under control, most importantly becoming carbon neutral, meaning we no longer add ancient fossil carbons to the atmosphere. This means switching to low carbon renewable energy sources, and probably making certain concessions in our society, especially when it comes to travel and electricity. Even this, though, is only a first step. Different greenhouse gases have different atmospheric lifespans. That is, they eventually get out of the atmosphere, but at varying rates. Methane, for example, comes out of the atmosphere in three to five years, despite being able to reflect more heat than carbon dioxide, which stays in the atmosphere for 30 to 95 years. Meaning carbon from emissions of cars and coal plants decades ago are still circulating in the air above us, heating up the planet. These all have to come out before the planet can stop warming up. To help do this, we need carbon sinks, places that absorb more carbon than they let off, like the rainforests. The issue is rampant deforestation both contributes to carbon in the atmosphere, but also destroys their potential as a carbon sink. And because of how rainforests create their own climate patterns, they can catastrophically and suddenly collapse. This process may be occurring in the Amazon Basin, which would be a devastating blow to our fight against climate change. Another feedback with damaging potential is warming on the tundra, which as the permafrost unfreezes, it releases carbon dioxide and methane. One way of stopping this is converting tundra into steppe by refaunating the tundra with megafauna, including recreated mammoths, which by compacting the tundra and snow will help maintain the permafrost. Without mitigation, we will have to adapt to a world where areas of the tropics are uninhabitable, water and food will be less secure, hundreds of millions of people migrating inland and away from the equator, and an extinction event that will rival the other great mass extinctions. Solving the problem of anthropogenic global warming is one of the most important fights of the 21st century, and particularly the 2020s. Because the longer we go on, the more expensive the cost of becoming carbon neutral and stopping the planet from warming above a few degrees will become. This video is part of an ongoing Fundamentals of Conservation Biology series with a new episode coming out each and every month. So if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to this channel, and ring the bell so you can be notified when the next video in this series comes out. Thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. Bye.